it's dark out. I've had so much Italian food, I'm starting to hate this place. I just need a break for one meal. It's this night, me and my girlfriend wander the streets of Rome in search of anything but Italian food. It's this night, we come upon a small sushi joint on the corner of a square. We order some rolls, some sashimi, and I get a bottle of sake. My prayers, if I prayed them, came true. My relief peaked as the waiter laid down a short bottle with a swirling magic elixir in it and two tiny cups that almost looked like bowls. I would later learn I ordered a nigori, which is cloudy, and this one, sweet. The ceremony of each tiny pour, my hands swallowing this tiny sake vessel and my lips taking the tiniest of sips. Ah, a much needed reprieve from pasta and wine. As I sat in my chair digesting my meal and sipping on the rest of my sake, I thought, how strange, ignorantly or not, I never thought I would be having sake while in Rome. In fact, sake wasn't something I thought much about. Not until then, at least. It made me think about all the breweries in Japan, and it made me wonder if anyone made it from scratch in New York. Could it even be made in New York? I knew, for instance, that with bourbon, it had to be made in the United States. But what were the rules for sake? I pulled my phone out, and after a quick Google search, I find two craft sake breweries right in Brooklyn, New York. One of them called Kato Sake Works, which is in the neighborhood of Bushwick. The following week, when I was back in the States, I sent an email to Kato Sake Works to set up an exploratory interview. After some email exchanges, I set up a date to meet Shinobu and his team. When you lost your grandparents, mm-hmm. obviously a big part of your life, like, was there a did, that, did you have any shift or was that any moment of realization of like, I guess, are, are there ways that you feel like what you're doing now is honoring them or like, it doesn't have to, I'm just mm-hmm. curious. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they played a big role when I grew up, so definitely I miss them. Oh, but at the same time, they are, you know, not only the grandparents, but also my mom too, but okay, you, you do whatever you wanna do. Oh, I support you. Please don't do something stupid or illegal, but as long as, you know, you are doing something right, we support you. So in my life, I, I felt that I was so supported to do things that I, I, I want to do. And then, of course, I did a lot of stupid things when I was younger. Or, and then every time they were like, okay. I think they were not happy, but they didn't tell me, you know, what to do. You know, they were more like, okay, you did something stupid, but that's your life. So, you know, you just take the accountability and then, you know, just move on. Kato Sake Works was embarking on an expansion to a new, bigger location. There was a lot at stake for Shinobu. The livelihood of his employees, the survival of his business. This would be a huge leap of faith. There's no room to stand still, only space to go forward and adventure into the great unknown. Would this work? I would have to wait and see over the next several months But first, I wanted to know more about the man that would be brave enough to put himself in this position. New York's a big city, and it's a dangerous place to take risks. I was born and grew up in Tokyo. I had a 
lot of bad sake during the you know college time. And uh, same way that you drink like cheap beer or cheap wine or cheap wine cooler, I had a lot of like cheap sake. At one point, I was like, okay, I hate sake. That's when I met my ex-boss, and he was like foodie and a sake connoisseur. He took me to a, you know, nicer, fancier, you know, sake bars and izakayas back in Tokyo. He was like, okay, you have not had a real sake yet. So, you know, but you need to, to drink good sake. One time we went for a nice uh, fancy izakayas near Lopongi. I had a chance to try one uh, sake that kind of changed my mind, like, okay, it's really good. I really wanna try more. I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, 2004, for the grad school. In the US, it's hard to find a good sake, uh, especially if it's in the budget for the cheap student. After graduation, I started working in the US. My uh, disposable income slowly <laughs> improved, and I graduated from the, the budget beer to, you know, a kind of national craft beer. I started going to local breweries in Nashville. You know, like every month there's a new brewery opening up, and then I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I go to every single brewery in Nashville. We had a map and we just checked everywhere. That kind of, you know, helped me to start talking with brewers and, you know, see the space like a commercial breweries. That, kind of inspired me a little bit to do my own. Beer, wine, more, everybody's doing this. Sake, nobody's doing that. And my friend was like, hey, Shinobu, maybe you should try to make sake. So that's when I started brewing sake by myself in my kitchen. I had like a small five gallon bucket and then I bought a small refrigerator and I converted the corner of the kitchen to uh, my small brewery. I enjoyed doing this. I made like a second batch, third batch. And people started asking, can I buy you a bottle? I want to bring this to my uh, parents' Thanksgiving dinner. That was a kind of moment that I started to think like, hey, I've been complaining about the current situation uh, with sake in the United States. Hey, this might be an answer. So I drove my Jeep from Tennessee to, to Brooklyn to start the business. I had some like friend's friend living in Bushwick and she kind of offered me a little bit of the tour of the neighborhood. And I love this neighborhood. Somehow it reminds me of my old hometown in Tokyo. Kind of dirty, industrial, residential, everything combined. There's many like artists and then, you know, music venues and the thrift stores and then elevated train track and then people grilling some chickens under the train track. That's typical neighborhood that I grew up in Tokyo. I just had a, like a vague business plan. And it took almost one year to build a space and get the license and everything up and running. And then COVID hit. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. I never operated before the COVID, so I don't know how to compare. But all the people in the blog was like, okay, hey, you know, I'm so sorry. I've seen you building and waiting for the license. And then finally you are able to open and this happened. And we did a, a one weekend of the soft openings. New York City uh, announced the capacity restrictions. So we have to shut it down. We had a grand opening scheduled. So we announced that, hey, sorry, grand opening needs to be postponed. So we were considered as an essential business. So we were able to continue the operation. And most of the breweries and wineries, they started selling on-site with bottles and cans in a, like a closed container. 
Well, at that time, we didn't have any bottles, so we have to order bottles. We have to, you know, put the labels and, and everything. During that time, it was all like contact dress, ordering. We didn't have a website set up yet, and we didn't have a paper bag, so those kind of things. So that's something we need to order last minute. And then we opened the door on April 1st as more like a bottle shop. I was so kind of, you know, surprised in a positive way that the amount of the support we got. We adapted as more like a COVID operation for the first one year, and then things started kind of improving. Around that time, all the other bars started reopening. Then we started uh, doing more wholesale as COVID situation uh, improves. Even with the hurdles Shinobu faced, he seemed steadfast in his goals. I'm sure as he went through the trials and tribulations of opening a sake brewery in New York City during a global pandemic, he felt at least a little stress. But looking back and being on the other side of things, he seemed resolute about his decisions. I'm not sure what kept him motivated during that time, but I do know that he adapted at every turn and even reached this point in the business where he would need more space and to take another risk. I wanted to know where this grit came from, and I had a feeling that it was something instilled in him long ago. Grandma has a bunch of friends, and when I was a kid, uh, my mom was working, so my grandparents kind of raised me. And she was like, okay, hey, Shinova, I'm sorry, but I have a, uh, like a neighborhood meeting tonight, so you, you know, I, I have to leave the home, but you know, here's a dinner, you, know, you take care of yourself. That kind of thing happened a lot. And then at her funeral, or her friends in the neighborhood started telling me and my grandpa that, hey, did you know that, you know, when she said she had a meeting, actually we are just drinking. So she went for like local izakayas and then they had a party and she came back home and she was so strong so that she, she was like, like sober, sober. And then my mom is a kind of same thing, I think, you know, being her daughter. And then sometimes she, she was sick, so I have to like, okay, are you okay? And then, you know, finally, I started to realize that, okay, probably she was not sick, she was just drunk. But always I feel like, okay, I have to make sake at least, you know, to the level that my grandma approves. But that, that being said, you know, I don't want to bring Japan or Tokyo to bushwork. We have a, like two kind of guiding principles. We want to make something genuine locally, but when I say local, half is like my route in Tokyo, but half is us in bushwick. So that's what we try to do. The challenge is with our current space, it's so small. There's no like scale of our economy at all. So we do one thing and we do next thing and we do the other thing. And then at the end, we just get like 200 bottles. Well, if you have a bigger space like here, basically you have to do the same thing, but you get 10 times more bottles. I knew sake was made with rice but that's really all I knew. And before I could dig deeper, I wanted to cover the basics. It's relatively simple. You have a steamed rice, and you have water, and you have yeast, and koji, which is a domesticated fungus that we grow on rice. We just mix everything together in a, in a tank, and we leave the tank in a cold place for like four weeks, and you get sake. It might be this simple for Shinobu, but I knew there was more to it. That's when I met Joni. 
She had just gotten to work and barely had a sip of coffee when I started asking questions about koji and fermentation methods. She kindly took a deep breath and discussed the cadence. Every week they build a new batch and every week they press a batch. With four fermentation tanks and a four week fermentation time period, this creates a constant flow of new sake. Oh, yeah, I can smell. yeah, it's like a fresh banana or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, so it's nice and far along. You can see most of the rice is broken down. It's easy to stir. So this is one that we built just last week. So you'll see it's super active, but definitely the rice isn't quite as broken down. And the aroma quite, isn't quite as strong yet either. The best way to describe koji, if you know beer making, um, you use malt to break down starches into sugar um, so that then you can ferment the sugar into alcohol. Koji is, does that same thing that malt does for our rice. So in rice, you have all this starch that isn't um, available for yeast to ferment into alcohol. So you need something to break down those starches um, and we use something called koji, which is basically, it's like an inoculated mold that we grow on rice. I'll show you something that's still going. It's about a 48 hour process rice. to grow it on the rice. So we get oh, the okay. spores in from Japan and then uh, you basically inoculate the spores onto our steamed rice, some of the steamed rice that will go in the tank. And then you grow it and kind of it's about a two-day process where you're growing it and, you, and then you kind of break it apart and air it out so that the roots of the koji has to go down into the center of the grain. Every day you're adding a little bit of rice water koji and then you're adding more and then more so that um, the koji can break down those starches as the yeast is fermenting um, throughout the week. You drink beer without knowing the detail about how beer is made. You know, you drink wine without knowing, you know, all the fermentation techniques behind wine making. While for sake, somehow people think that you need to know a little bit about sake, and then that's like, you know, 95% of the Japanese people don't know how sake is made either. inoculated the rice yesterday and this is our first time breaking it up and right before the pandemic happened I was living in LA and I had packed up everything I had to go work on a vineyard in Italy and then everything shut down and of course it was like starting in Italy so there was no way for me to go so I stayed with family for a little bit in Denver and worked at a small wine shop and that wine shop had a Colorado sake and that was the first time I realized that people were making sake out of the states. I kind of didn't have it on my radar at that point. I enjoyed drinking it I just thought it was only being made in Japan. I reached out to a few breweries and most of them were like, no we don't need help, it's a pandemic. Um, but Shinobu had just started out. And he was like, you know, maybe <laughs> once a week I could use a little bit of help. Uh, do you want to come by the brewery and we'll, we'll talk? And so I flew out to New York to like casually stop by the brewery. Um, my little brother lived out here, so I just crashed on his couch and he hired me and I never left. It's kind of crazy to have like three people working there full time with all the like rice washing and bottling and everything. There's no space, but everybody's so good now. Like, you know, if you go to like a busy small bar and then you have like two bartenders working in tandem and then they know how to do things in a very tight inside bar counters, right? So we are working like that. The brewery was extremely small. In fact, it used to be an art gallery, but the team moved with grace around the room. 
There was such a musicality to the way Evan, Joni, and Shinobu worked together with such limited space. It was almost like a dance. The pandemic allowed us to grow slowly. Everybody is like very, you know, tight knit community. And then I think if we started this business pre pandemic or post pandemic, probably that didn't happen. Every time we try to do like a food pairing or like a flavor, you know, profile, we know that our customer doesn't eat white fish sashimi every day. You know, you eat very loud and noisy American food. Typical or you know, premium sake that I order when I go to Japan is more on the cleaner, delicate side. Oh, well, our sake is a little bit louder, bolder, heavier. Then bathroom in front of me right now. So that section in the bathroom. From here is a production space. So I think the wall, the end of the bathroom is like here. And the end of the bathroom is a little bit oh, closer to the entrance. But from here on is a production space. And we have to put like a barricade or something so that people cannot come in. That's like a regulation. Oh, but at least you can see what's going on right. inside. The very end, we are still concrete floor is there. That's the area for office, lab, and the koji room. So you saw our small koji room, right? So we'll have a bigger koji room over there. Probably 10 times bigger than what we have right now. Our, our current koji room is too small. Yeah. Right? Like, that's a, like a one person sauna size. My second time visiting the brewery, I spent the day with Evan. He was pressing a batch. He was methodical and calming. He spoke of the potential disaster if one of the bags had a small hole or wasn't folded right. Sake in the making would be spilled out everywhere and would be cause for a restart. So taking the time to check each bag was an important step in the process. Then Evan told me how he ended up in the small sake brewery in Bushwick. Yeah, I met, I met Shinobu one day when he came in and um, I think it was, he brought in a anniversary bottle, which is a super like once a year premium sake that we do that is like, you know, instead of using this, you just hang the mash in the bags and then only kind of the most delicate part drips through. Um, so he was walking around to all the wholesale accounts and giving those bottles away as kind of like a thank you. And then me and my coworker were there and we had no idea kind of how special the bottle was and we ended up just sitting and drinking the entire bottle in like one sitting and, and loved it. It was amazing. It was definitely like one of the better, best sakes I've ever had. And I was like, oh, this is made in Brooklyn, like 15 minutes away from here. Like, that's, that's crazy. I got to learn more about this. I, at the same time, I was kind of like learning more about sake um, through the wine store as well and kind of got the idea that I wanted to to try to work work here. Um, eventually, applied to work here. Um, yeah, and then mostly I was doing sales at first and then would always kind of peek over here and wanted to be more on the production side. Like for me, tasting is always just so, so subjective, you know? I want people to not necessarily think there's like a wrong or right way to taste something. So what I try to do is I'll, I'll, I do like a sake brewing presentation first about how we make it, 
and just try to get people like understanding the process as much as possible. And then when they taste it, we have a little section to take notes on what they taste. And then I try to kind of like be a little bit hands off and not be like, this is what I taste, these are my notes. in Japan who work for these sake breweries um, see expanding outside of Japan into more uh, foreign markets as kind of like the future of what will be important about keeping sake alive, you know, um, because I think fo focusing solely on domestic production, um, you have some pretty big limits to that. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement uh, around, you know, the growing industry in, in the U.S. and in other places. Evan and Joni both followed their passions and interests and now found themselves making exceptional sake. Years into working there, Shinobu wonders if they knew what they were getting themselves into. They've been working for, for full time for like over two years. I'm 100% sure that they didn't know what they signed up for. <laughs> Typical wine bottle has like a very fancy, you know, this smells like the soil after the rain kind of thing. I didn't have that kind of vocabulary. So I asked my friend, how do you describe your product in a way that it's easily communicated? And we spent some time uh, drinking, eating, half party, half work kind of thing. And he started writing things down on a piece of paper. And then as a joke, he put some like, okay, this is a type of sounds that I can uh, relate to from a specific product. And he's a musician, of course. And then I was like, oh, that's quite interesting. Let's put that on the bottle because drinking is more like a holistic experience. And of course, taste is important, but like sound kind of helps you to set the tone and the vibe of the way that you enjoy the specific product. So you want the yeast to have an easy environment to proliferate for a day, and then you add kind of the more, the, the bigger ratios of stuff. This project, we are borrowing a lot of money. All the numbers on the account that I'm seeing is like something that's kind of scary. We can make sake in a way that we really want. And then we have equipment, the space to do the experiment that we've been wanting to do, but we didn't have a time or space. Finally, we can do all the things that we really wanted to do. My grandpa, he was a guy who spent on the weekends, start building some random stuff, or he has all the toolboxes, and then also he collects all the garbages, and then my grandma hated it because he's one of the person that if you find like a box candy, he cannot throw that away. And he always think about, okay, how can I make it from this? And uh, in our, our small house in Tokyo, we had a bunch of like junk stuff that he collected. And then we spent some weekends, like try to build something together. He taught me how to cut wood, how to paint, how to use like soldering irons. My parents separated when I was very young. So I don't know much about my father's side. My mom's side, my grandfather, didn't drink at all. Or he had like a small amount of plum wine and he was so happy. 
at some occasions, I saw my gram grandma drinking with, with us. Like when, every time we go for like a you know, family trip, you know, we do go to a restaurant and she was like enjoying a, like, you know, a glass or two of sake. When you order sake, you have like a small ceramic cup and the sake is in the, the white carafe and you drink like a small amount. And she always refused to do that because she wanted to have more. So she was like, oh, can, I, can I get a big glass and a pour sake so that I don't have to do that kind of, you know, small thing all the time. Uh, she was like, that looks so poor and miserable. I don't like that. I want to have a big, big uh, gulp of sake. You know, in the US, there's, you know, there's no specific guideline that sake should be this, right? So you can do whatever you want to do. It's uh, up to your creativity. But uh, so we do some interesting stuff, but always I feel that is this something that my grandma approves? I don't want to make fake stuff. I don't want to cut the corners, even though that's kind of, you know, there's an easier way to make things, right? Is that fully cheating it, but actually cheating? Did you say I've been in traffic for 33 minutes now, or I'll be there in 33 minutes? Do you, do you do you have any idea how long what your GPS says how long? 6.35, okay. All right, all right, we are here. Yep. So this is a back bar flat room, but we are not gonna serve food. So this is for our lunch. <laughs> <laughs> We've been cooking together all the time, so we are like, okay, we need to have a little bit bigger <laughs> kitchen. That's the cooking side. And then other than that, this side is a fermentation tank. Mm -hmm. So five big ones and four small ones that we already have in Central. Yeah. And then this side is a stretch tank. So we have two of those, oh, and then two are a little bit smaller, and then two tiny ones. This street is approved for the open street program. Yeah, so there will be a big opening ceremony and then something like that. Will you guys be brewing here yet? That's the plan. Not only only brewing, but we are open by then. That's a plan. So 45 days out? Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Is it possible? Let's what? ask that question to Matt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but right now they are saying that they will finish all the construction by April first. So. Oh, still on that date? But I know all our customers are like, hey, okay, when can I come in, sit down and then drink? And we are like, yeah, very soon, very <laughs> soon, very soon. six times the size of our current tank and then there's one extra one so right now we're brewing in four tanks and there are five here so it'll end up being ten times the capacity yeah just excited, excited. a little nervous for the taken down off the thing relieved yeah at least it's here <laughs> it's definitely like a big step 
towards actually getting to be in the space brewing. So much of the progress you don't get to see physically, you know, it's like everything is moving at the same time, so it's like little steps, but sometimes when it's something like this, it feels so drastic. Nervousness was a primary emotion, and then I didn't have much of excitement. <laughs> I've never seen that big tanks, or I think that's the most, probably one of the most expensive purchase I've made in my life. And then the heaviest stuff that I possessed in my life, I guess. It was super stressful. I didn't really sleep the day before. And for some reason, my Instagram account started showing me all the like uh, trailer crashing to the bleach kind of videos. And I could not stop scrolling. I'm so glad it's over. I'm glad everything is here and everything is here without any scratch. So I'm so happy now. <laughs> About a month later, Kato Sake Works would throw a soft opening party, letting people know they were close to opening and that they were now a part of the neighborhood. We are lucky we moved in here when they started doing the open streets. So that was the first time that this street had some kind of forum for the, all the business owners to meet together. We are lucky to be in that group since the beginning of that formation. And then everybody's so helpful, like especially the KCBC next door. They are helping us to unload the tank, put the heavy equipment in. You know, the bartenders are here to help us uh, to navigate the hospitality side. And then all the other businesses, they are here to support. So it's a really nice neighborhood. The space between you and me right now, we didn't have that kind of luxury at the, all the space. And because we spend so much time on that cramped all, all the space, we appreciate the current space probably way more than any like typical people feel about the space. Yeah, it's great. It's really cool. I've never seen the space looking so like just together. You know, yeah, yeah. We've been doing this for like a year and a half, so we need to. We need to, we need to start, yeah. yeah. It's like a graduation. So yes, you liked your kindergarten, it was so fun, but you have to graduate. You know, you like a high school, but you cannot be in the high school forever. Kind of same, same, same feeling. So yeah, I'm nostalgic. I, I have a lot of memories, good memories with that space. But at the same time, you know, we, we have to grow. The Kato Sake Works team was finally in the new space and even welcoming some guests. But they were still serving sake made in the old brewery. There was a new unknown right ahead of them, making sake with brand new equipment that had 10 times the capacity of their old operation. The excitement and the anxiety in the room was palpable. It was like watching them stand on the precipice of a make or break moment. I think I worry too much. <laughs> and maybe I'm a little stressed, oh, and maybe that stress kind of has a little bit of the ripple effect to the people around me. The things like opening this space, getting more tanks, you know, the construction permit, borrowing money from the bank, everything. I never thought I could do that.
everybody's taking care of me because I'm so stressed. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I hope that, you know, we are providing some fun space to spend some time of your life together. Employment is a big commitment because you're spending a lot of time. Like you spend eight hours at this space trying to get something done, but also you can spend that eight hours of your time to do something else. Deciding to dedicate that hours to this crazy idea of like opening a sake brewery, that's really a precious thing. I always think that how I can return that back because money, if you spend like, you know, $100, maybe you can recoup that $100 somewhere else. But time, if you spend eight hours here, you cannot return, you cannot get that eight hours back even though you don't like it. That is a very uh, important thing to me that, hey, my team members, for some reason, decided to spend time with me and stick around and then do kind of things together. How can we make that time beneficial for them to help their life passion or personal goals? I, I still cannot sleep when I see the bank account, so I'm not there yet. Every day I'm so worried until we get to the point that we can kind of, you know, swim and then breathe. Oh, we, we are not there yet. Yeah, maybe that's another reason that we are still living in like a day-to-day -day mode. Hopefully within, you know, a few months, we'll be at the point that, hey, I think we made it so that from here, we can think more about the future, how to grow. But right now we are just, you know, running and then, you know, catching up. Because we are still in a, in a mood to have a luxury to look things back yet, so it's still hard. It's kind of the same way that, you know, when your hair starts growing gray, you don't realize every day that it's getting a little bit grayer. But after like five years, you realize that, oh, my, my hair is so gray now. When I had a chance to talk to the owner of Brooklyn Brewery, Steve Hindi, uh, he joked that, yeah, we made an uh, overnight success over 10 years. So I hope that we'll have something like that, but at this point, we are just doing the things that we have to do today and tomorrow. I've been doing this for four or five years. Around that time, it was still not even emerging market level. And then nobody knows, people are so skeptical, but now I see more and more money is flowing into the, the industries. And then there's a lot of interest from the maker side that, hey, I want to make sake. In the past, the biggest constraint was there's no resource available. Now there's some resource, so if you know how to make sake, if you have a passion to do that, and if you're smart enough to, you know, unlock the secret of how to make good sake, I think there's a way to make that work. You know, sake has a kind of magic thing that you can instantly make friends. You meet with the strangers at the Blue Alley, and then 
after like three beers, you two become friends, or you drink with your friend, and then after three beers, you become best friends. One person speaks one language, the other person speaks different language. They barely communicate each other, but if there's an alcoholic beverage, after like two hours, for some reason, they kind of communicate each other. Well, I'm not saying that sake can, you know, achieve the world peace, but there are certain things that our sake can kind of play. We are just adding a little more fun to, you know, hopefully many people's lives. I'm not doing the work that necessity for the society, but at the same time, I'm kind of you know, contributing to the some fun factor of the life. Yeah, maybe that's the reason that I woke up and then come back and then make more cycle.